We are so blessed and so happy to have Ajahn Brahmali here with us for our regular Clear Mountain interviews. And I'll just read a quick biography of Ajahn Brahmali. So Ajahn Brahmali was born in Norway in 1964. He first became interested in Buddhism and meditation in his early 20s after a visit to Japan. Having completed degrees in engineering and finance, he began his monastic training as an Anagarika, keeping the eight precepts in England at Amaravati and Chithurst Buddhist monasteries. After hearing the teachings from Ajahn Brahm, he decided to travel to Australia to train at Bodhinyana Monastery. Ajahn Brahmali has lived at Bodhinyana Monastery since 1994 and was ordained as a bhikkhu with Ajahn Brahm as his preceptor in 1996. Ajahn Brahmali Mahatera has now been in robes for 26 years. I think that math is correct. Hopefully. It is correct, yeah. <laughs> okay. Ajahn Brahmali's knowledge of the Pali language and of the suttas is excellent. A regular contributor to Discourse.Sutta Central, he has also published two essays on dependent origination and a book called The Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Text, which is a really great book uh, with the Buddhist Publication Society in collaboration with Bhante Sujato. So yeah, thank you so much, Bhante. Um, so one thing which people might know you from uh, is your, um, your excellent work with the early Buddhist texts, this concept of EBT, early Buddhist texts. Would you be willing to give an outline of what that means for people who maybe aren't familiar with the term? Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, as I mentioned before, is one of the kind of areas that really interests me, and I think is actually extraordinarily important, actually, for a proper understanding of what Buddhism is about. It really matters enormously. And the, the basic idea is to try to uh, kind of come back to an idea of what, was, what did actually the Buddha himself teach? Can we say anything about uh, you know wh what is the origin of these uh, of this whole thing we call Buddhism, which is a massive historical movement, uh, and it's moved into the world in various ways. You know, gone from country to country, and has been influenced by cultures around the world. Uh, gone to China and become Chan Buddhism. Gone to Japan and become Zen. Uh, and it goes. It kind of alters a little bit. It changes. The doctrine changes a little bit. The core ideas of Buddhism are transformed because of the cultural conditioning that comes with moving into a new culture. So for that reason, it's actually very interesting to ask, well, where does all this or originate from? Where does it actually come from? And, um, and, and sometimes, just to start out, sometimes people think that it doesn't matter so much yeah, where it comes from. Buddhism is Buddhism, and, and there's just different ways of looking at the, uh, you know, the Buddhist teachings, and it doesn't actually matter what is original and what is not. And I, I hear this view a lot around the world, and I think it is profoundly mistaken. I mean, very, very seriously mistaken. And the reason for that is because Buddhism is about a particular insight into reality. And that insight is an understanding really of non-self. And either you have that insight, yeah, you have it fully and completely, or you haven't. And that distinction is like almost like an unbridgeable gap. It's like a chasm between the two, like a precipice. And you either you are standing on top of the mountain you have kind of climbed up the mountain and you are free of the you know of it, or you are standing on the other side a bit further down and you're trying to kind of reach the top and you and there's an unbridgeable gap between these two things and so that um, because and this is how it is basically talked about in the suttas yeah stream entry is this kind of big bang where you kind of that you never forget in the rest of your life as it says in the suttas you always remember where that happened and um uh, because of that, uh, uh, it actually matters enormously whether you have that insight or you haven't. Uh, uh, one side, the ones who have the insight will understand what the Buddhist teaching is about. Uh, the other side will have some idea, but they will also have a certain degree of wrong view because they haven't actually seen the teachings fully yet. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and so the question of who has this insight and who hasn't actually, for that reason, matters enormously. And only those people who have that full insight uh, will be able to teach Buddhism fully and completely. The other ones will very likely to make mistakes because they haven't got the full right view right yet. And so then we have to ask, well, who are the people who have this insight? 
And that question is very difficult to answer with any certainty. You look around the world, there's lots of very inspiring monastics, monks and nuns, and there are some very inspiring lay people around as well. You can find that in all the various Buddhist cultures. But it's very hard to be certain that they have that full insight. They may have it partially, they may have been gone a long way on the path. And there's only one person that we have to say with certainty as Buddhists had that insight, and that is the Buddha. Because if the Buddha didn't have the insight, well, then the whole thing collapses. Uh, there is nothing really there. We know that the entire history of Buddhism, uh, all the cultural evolution that had all the scriptures that have been developed, you know, over uh, the last two and a half thousand years, they are founded. Uh, they take the Buddhist suttas as their um, uh, foundation. You know, this is actually what everything else is built on. And if the Buddha got it wrong, well, everything else collapses. Everything else is meaningless. It only has meaning insofar as the words of the Buddha have any meaning here. So we have to assume that the only person we can assume with, uh, that we have to assume was had an insight into these things uh, is the Buddha himself. And for that reason, the word of the Buddha matters enormously, yeah, because everyone else is gonna be a degree of uncertainty, but with the Buddha, we have to have that assumption. Uh, so then the, um, the next question then uh, arises, and that question is, well, uh, can we know with any certainty what the Buddha said? And the answer, I think, is yes. And the reason we can say that is because there are certain teachings in Buddhism that are universal. Yeah, you find them in all the various strands of Buddhism. You find them in Tibetan Buddhism. You find it in Mahayana Buddhism. You find it in the various schools of Theravada. You find it in the, you know everywhere. And these teachings that are fundamental to these uh, Buddhist, uh, that are found everywhere in the Buddhist world, uh, well, these are the things that we can say with a high degree of certainty are the word of the Buddha. So what is that? Uh, and what that is, and it, this is a, a very interesting, uh, you know, area of study. And it, I think this area of study it started with a, an Englishman, uh, an Englishman who was a scholar of Chinese, his name was Samuel Beale, and he lived back in the 1870s or something like that. Uh, Samuel Beale, he was reading the uh, uh, Chinese, some of the ancient Chinese suttas, and also some of the Vinaya in the ancient Chinese. Uh, and then he saw, you know, he also knew some Pali or had some access to Pali or whatever. Uh, and then he realized that, lo and behold, that these rules <laughs> in Chinese are exactly the same things that we have in Pali. Uh, and this is kind of, this was for him astonishing yeah? because the Chinese culture and the Pali culture are uh, divided by massive barriers of culture, of language, of, of, of distance, of time, of all of these kind of things. Yeah. And despite those enormous, that enormous distancing, yeah, here was something that they had in common. Yeah? And then he made the prediction and the prediction that he made back in the 1870s or something like that was that, well, I, his guess was that all of those scriptures, the suttas that you find in uh, uh, in Pali language, uh, very likely were also found in Chinese. Yeah? And of course, he turned out to be right. That was a very interesting prediction that he made. It turned out to be correct. Uh, and uh, so what you find then is that uh, uh, the are in common with Chinese Buddhism, or the Chinese, you know, Chinese, the whole history of Chinese Buddhism, and what is in common with the Pali Buddhism is precisely a core, um, uh, you know, core suttas, basically the four Nikayas, the long discourse, the middle length discourses, the connected discourses, the numerical discourses, and of course, a large part of the Vinaya Pitaka. This is what is in common between these two vastly different cultures. And then as time has gone by, as we have studied these things more, we have realized this is not just the case between Buddhism and is also basically the same kind of suttas, except that they are is much more lacking uh, in the uh, Tibetan uh, scriptures. Uh, there are Sanskrit teachings. There are uh, uh, Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. Uh, teachings. There are various Prakrits, which are the early, you know, the various kind of local languages in India. And again and again, we find the same thing. What is in common between all of these things uh, are what is equivalent uh, to the four Nikayas, basically, in the Pali language. A little bit more than that, but that's essentially what it comes down to. Uh, and so what 
this means is that um, anything apart from that is, uh, you know, is maybe correct. We don't really know. It's very hard to say. It has very powerful and important consequences for how we look at the Pali Suttas, uh, how we consider the entire Theravada tradition. Very often it is said that, you know, it, when, when I say these kind of things, probably some of the people think I'm some sort of Theravada fundamentalist. Yeah, Theravada is the best. Yeah, everything else is bad. <laughs> But, but that is not really the point. The point is not that at all. In fact, Theravada itself has also been, has evolved and has changed over time. And many things in Theravada are not really commensurate or, you know, with the suttas. And they turn out, sometimes they can actually be corrupted. So in Theravada Buddhism, we have exactly the same problem as they have in Mahayana Buddhism, that there is a core sutta as the early teaching and then there is a development that's happened over time long period after that and um, so we too can actually benefit enormously from this kind of distinction between the earliest teachings uh, which are clearly in common between all the various schools and all the various traditions uh, and later addition which includes the abhidhamma yeah the thing which is often said to be the highest expression of the buddhist teachings uh, turns out to be Maybe not, probably not the Buddhist teachings at all. Yeah, and that's kind of an eye opener. Or, of course, things like the Visuddhi Manga, which is considered the, by many, the kind of greatest meditation manual. Yeah, <laughs> in the Buddhist world. Or, of course, everything else that has been, uh, uh, you know, um, come down to us after long time after the Buddha. All of that is, it may not be wrong, yeah, but it is dangerous to rely on those things. Uh, and especially dangerous to take those and give those precedent precedence over the suit that, that is especially dangerous. So anyway, I better stop there. But I there's, <laughs> there's probably more to be said. But, uh, yeah. Monte, that's that's very a very helpful and uh, yeah all around introduction to the the idea. So you mentioned uh, specifically perhaps the Abhidhamma, you know, for various different reasons um, might be. You know, questionably part of this um, group of early Buddhist texts. What about within the the Sutta Pitaka itself? I've I've seen that yourself and Bhante Sujato and others have actually um, begun to speculate on which parts of the Sutta Pitaka. So, for people who aren't familiar, you've got the Tripitaka, the whole Pali Canon, which is three parts. You've got the the Vinaya, the Sutta Pitaka, and the Abhidhamma. And um, I'd be be curious if you'd be willing to speak about which parts of the Sutta Pitaka are um, even possibly questionable, questionably part of this earliest uh, strata of the teachings? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the things about the Sutta Pitaka is that it is a very mixed bag in terms of um, uh, what it uh, includes. And, yeah, and you, uh, there are parts of the Sutta Pitaka that look like the Abhidhamma, they don't really look like the suttas at all. Uh, and uh, you get the feeling that it is a very mixed bag, something that has evolved over a very long period of time. And one of the giveaways for that is that the Kudaka Nikaya, which means the short Nikaya, the short collection, is the longest of all the collections. That's one of those kind of paradoxes. How did the shortest, the, the thing which has the name, the short collection, become this incredibly long one? And of course, the obvious answer is that it probably started out as a short collection and then gradually, accumulated things over time and eventually become this massive thing which has either 15 or 18 books depending on how you count the uh, uh, the content and so it, you know when, one of the ways of deciding you know which books are the most authentic again is to do this thing i mentioned before which we often call comparative study where you look at these books and you look at whether they exist in different traditions or whether it is peculiar to the theravada tradition and what you find is that there are certain things that are um, peculiar. Actually, a lot of it is peculiar to the Tibana tradition. So in the with the suttas, the things that they have in common is a large part of the long discourses, uh, most of it, uh, a lot, most of the uh, middle-length discourses, uh, a large part of the connected discourses, uh, a little bit less of the numerical discourse, but still a large part of that. Uh, and when we come to the Kudaka Nikaya, the, sh the short collection, that's where we start to see a big uh, divergence uh, between the various schools. So, so uh, in the, for example, the, some of the most well-known books of the Kudaka Nikaya is the Dhammapada, yeah, obviously. And we find the Dhammapada also in the Sanskrit tradition, the Chinese tradition, the 
various Prakrit versions, and it is often called the Udana Varga in those traditions. It has a different name. So you can see here the names are even different, right? So they, it seems like there has been some sort of change happening at some point. That's why they are, are different. Udana Varga obviously somehow relates a bit to the Udana in the Pali. It's like there's been a mix up there between the various books in these other traditions. So the Dhammapada has a lot in common against. That's, you know, probably fairly, I think a lot of that will be considered fairly going back to the earliest period. Uh, then you have the Udana in the Pali. And there's a very interesting study that was done by Venerable Analayo, who was one of the kind of great, uh, uh, great scholars of comparative study. And he did a study of the Udana. And he showed basically that in the Udana, the most authentic part are the verses. Yeah? And a lot of the prose there actually varies enormously from one school to the other one. But the verses are, are the most um, authentic probably part of the Udana. Which is interesting because some of the stories are very, are very nice. And they're quoted very often. Yeah? It's a really shame. It's a big shame that those stories might not be authentic, because they're really cool stories. Uh, and then you have the, uh, you have the Sutta Nipata, yeah, another beloved book of the Theravada tradition. And uh, in there you have the there's five chapters of the Sutta Nipata. The last two are called the Atakavaga and the Parayanavaga. And those last two chapters have also have parallels in the uh, Chinese and the Sanskrit traditions. So a few of the suttas also have parallels, like the Ratana Sutta has a parallel. Uh, I think the uh, Kangavisana Sutta, the um, Rhinoceros Horn Sutta, has a, has a parallel. There's a few suttas, but the main things that have parallels there is the Atakavaga, the chapter of eights, and the Parayanavaga, the chapter on the going beyond you know, in, in that, that one. Uh, and uh, that's very interesting because uh, those two last chapters, uh, they are also talked about elsewhere in the Sutta Pitaka. Yeah, they're actually mentioned by name. They were mentioned by name in the Vinaya. You know, one of the famous stories in the Vinaya is where uh, uh, this monk called Sona, this monk called Sona had come from somewhere far in the Western country, a really wild place. Uh, and he comes to see the Buddha. And then when the Buddha uh, sees him, he says to him, well, can you recite something? And he recites the Atakavanga, yeah, <laughs> which is really kind of nice. So there is obviously that there is a lot of reasons for thinking that these teachings are fairly original. They go back a long way. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the Terigata and Teragata. These are the verses of the elder monks and the elder, elder nuns. Uh, and they, again, are a bit of a mixed bag. Some of them seem to go back very, very early. They also have uh, parallels in other traditions. So, and some of that is going to be early. Some of it is going to be a bit later. Yeah. And uh, basically, you can, you know, it's hard sometimes to pull these things apart, but uh, you might be able to do that with a bit of study the vocabulary, perhaps study the way things are expressed, some of the ideas that come through, you might be able to pull apart what is the earliest and what is the latest. Uh, and then that is really the core part of the Kudakanikaya. All the books it, that come after that are far more dubious. And uh, the reason we can say that, first of all, is that there is very little parallel. You know, the Jata customs are very peculiar to the to the Pali tradition. There are, some of the stories also exist in the other traditions, but it's much more random which stories occur than which 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 ones don't. Uh, and then you have all the other books that are very peculiar to the Pali tradition. Yeah, you have the Peta Vatu, you have the Vimana Vatu, you have the Patisambhita Maga, uh, you have the uh, uh, what else is in there? Uh, well, the Buddha Vangsa, yeah, the Charya Pitaka is in there, uh, and all of these things. They're very peculiar to the Theravada tradition. And read them, uh, you actually get the feeling that this is a very different kind of literature. Uh, yeah, the style of expression is very different. The vocabulary that is used is different. Uh, grammatical endings are often different. Uh, yeah, and it's it, you know, if you understand a little bit of Pali, if you have a little bit of linguistic insight, uh, you will know straight away that this is diff a different language from the early Buddhist teachings. And uh, if you think about it in English, if you have exactly the same thing in English, actually in any language you look, look at, uh, if you take a work of English that was written back in the mid 19th century, take Charles Dickens, right? Who wrote about London in the mid 19th century, straight away when you read it, you know that this is a literature that was written some time ago. You can still understand it. Uh, the language is largely the same, but there's something about the style 
something about the feel that tells you straight away this is a uh, com comes from an earlier period if you go back to shakespeare well then it is like you can sometimes you can't even understand it yeah it's a kind of it's really hard to understand that if you go back even earlier to uh, chaucer or whatever some of those really early english uh, writers uh, actually you probably won't understand part of it because the vocabulary everything is so different uh, and it's exactly the same thing with the Pali. Pali language is just like English language. And when we see the changes, well, we know straight away that uh, something is going on here. And this was one of the points, by the way, that was made by uh, Thomas Rhys Davids. Some of you have probably heard about Thomas Rhys Davids, uh, the early translator, and actually very, uh, very sharp uh, um, commentator on Buddhism and Pali languages in general. And he made precisely that point, yeah, that uh, you can tell the evolution of language. We can use that to, if you understand Pali well, you have a good grounding this, in this language, you will be able to tell, just like in English, that there is evolution going on there. So, you know, when we talk about this um, evolution, early Buddhism uh, and uh, later Buddhism, there are lots of pointers that we can use uh, to decide what is early Buddhism, what is later Buddhism. It is not just comparative study, it is evolution of language, evolution of ideas, uh, changes in vocabulary, grammatical uh, changes. And if you add all of these things up, uh, you get a very uh, coherent a picture which kind of reinforces itself uh, and points in one direction only, really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> one, wonderful answer. Bonte, am I correct that the Metta Sutta, uh, the Karaniya Metta Sutta, only appears in the Pali? There aren't uh, counterparts in the, the Chinese canon or the Tibetan canon? Is that accurate? So it seems, yes. It seems to be only in the uh, Pali canon. Now, so, uh, yeah. That seems like an interesting case because the language, the vocabulary, the grammar seem to be on the same level as or very similar to that used in you know, suttas which are very firmly in this early Buddhist text um, core, as well as the content. I mean, the, the content is very much uh, in line. It's only this, this lack of having uh, correlates in the, the other canons. What do you think about um, things like this? Yeah, how do you hold the metta sutta and other um, discourses which are so fundamental to um, yeah. Theravada or traditional Theravada um, contexts and um, doctrine. Yeah, I, I think you have to be careful in taking these, um, you have to be careful not to go too far with kind of rejecting things that don't have a common basis in, in, in all the traditions, because uh, we know that you know, there are, um, uh, we know that the way that these canons have developed, how they have been uh, put together uh, is a bit ha haphazard sometimes. Uh, and uh, so, for example, you know, the, we know that in the uh, uh, Chinese tradition, the, uh, uh, the, the versions that they have of the long discourses, for example, comes from the Dharmaguptaka tradition, it's one of the early schools of Buddhism, whereas the uh, Madhyama Agama, which is equivalent to the Majjhima Nikaya, or roughly equivalent, comes from the Sarvastivada tradition. And the Sangyukt Agama also comes from the Sarvastivada, whereas the Ekotarika Agama, which is equivalent to the Anguttara Nikaya, we don't even know which cause it comes from. It might come from the Mahasangika, but actually it is still debated where it actually comes from. So because we don't have a coherent canon in Chinese or any other language, and that the way the placing of the suttas in the canons was sometimes different, it may be that these suttas did exist in those early schools, but they haven't been uh, actually made their way into the Chinese canon precisely because they may have been in a different collection for that school. For example, in the Savastivan, they may have been in the Ekotrika uh, Agama, which doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, it only exists in the Mahasangika school or whatever. So the way that the suttas were collected, different suttas would have gone into different collection in the different schools, means that some of them will not appear in the Chinese. And that does not necessarily mean that uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, it isn't original. So then what you have to do is you have to ask precisely what you said. You have to look at the language, you have to look at the idea, rest, and if they are acceptable, then I think, uh, you know, I think we can accept it as authentic, uh, at least until we have a you know, larger picture of these things. And I agree with this, terrible. If, if the meta suit that wasn't original, that would be 
that were terrible, right? Because it's one of the most beautiful suttas in the Pali Canon. And it's so nice. Oh, and it's a wonderful suitta to talk about. And it has lots of ideas in it that are very useful to how to develop better. So uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. Man. Thank you, Ajahn. And um, following up on that question, um, I'm curious just with a broad perspective, what the say two or three most you know important insights you feel we've gained from these comparative studies in the past 10 years or 15 years have been um, very specifically. Uh, I know that uh, Bonte Analios pointed to, for example, or maybe it's even before him, um, comparative studies revealing that the fourth Satipatthana of mindfulness of Dhammas is you know, or perhaps was originally just the seven factors of awakening versus the five hindrances. Um, I don't know how true that is, but I found it to be really helpful. And I'm curious if there's, you know, a few other gems that you found emerge from this that have genuinely affected your understanding of the teaching or your practice. Yeah, I uh, I, I think the, uh, the Satipatthana Sutta is actually a very good example of, uh, you know, of a comparative study is very fruitful. And uh, the reason is because the sutta is taken so seriously in meditation circles, yeah? So if we, our view of that sutta changes, uh, it also changes our whole approach to meditation and to, to contemplation or whatever, changes as a consequence because it is such a, considered such a core sutta. Now, the, you know, one of the, one of the things that I have always found problematic with the Theravada tradition is, first of all, this kind of um, putting the Satipatthana Sutta on a pedestal, yeah, as if it is very special and it is unique. And in fact, it is just one Sutta among many, and there's no real reason to put it on the pedestal. The, one of the reasons why it is put on the pedestal is because two versions of it, but that seems to be peculiar to the Theravada. This is probably just a duplication happened with, within the Theravada. And that already reduces some of its importance. So this is the first thing. I would say it is one sutta. It is not unimportant, but it's just as important as any other sutta. It shouldn't be given a special place. The Buddha doesn't say anywhere that this is the most important sutta. He just says, you know, it's one among others. And, uh, but the, the more important and more interesting thing about the Satipatthana Sutta is precisely, as you point out, there seems to have been a lot of accretion over time yeah it seems to have really changed over time and uh, venerable analio is one person who has pointed this out one person who has made an even more thorough study of this is uh, Bhante Sujato. Uh, he, he has written a book called the uh, history of mindfulness which you may have seen uh, and uh, and it's very interesting because the comparative study that we see there really brings back what really is the core aspect of this sutra so, so if we start with body contemplation for example uh, he, uh, but the Sujato argues that uh, the most uh, important part of body contemplation is the 31 parts of the body. Yeah, this is the most important because it exists in all versions of the Satipatthana Sutta. The second most important is the uh, four elements that exist in all bar one of the uh, uh, of the ver of the Satipatthana Sutta, and uh, many of the others. The, the others actually. Ex uh, I found an even lesser, even fewer of the versions of the Satipatthana Sutta. And this is very interesting because, um, for example, the passage on, uh, on Satisampajanya, which is found in the Satipatthana Sutta, yeah, the uh, clear comprehension, or mindfulness and clear comprehension, or what you, however you want to translate it, uh, that passage uh, yeah, probably does not belong to the earliest version of the Satipatthana Sutta. And that's very very, very interesting because this particular passage is used, for example, to uh, uphold the idea that we're supposed to be mindful during daily life. Yeah, we're supposed to do meditation continuously during daily life. Uh, yeah, this is kind of what it is used to used for. Uh, but if you look at the way the suttas outside of the Satipatthana Sutta, the distinction they make, they say that Satipatthana and they explain that compound, they say that sam Sampajanya is the idea of, you know, having clear comprehension when you walk into the village, when you receive your alms food, when you go to the toilet, when you eat, this kind of stuff, when you speak or whatever. But Sati is the four, 
focuses on mindfulness. So, yeah, and from that, it sounds as if Sampajana does not actually belong in the Satipatthana Sutta because Sati is the full focus of mindfulness, where Sampajanya is this other thing. Yeah? It's, they're actually separated out. Uh, and this is a passage you see in a number of places in the Sutta. It is not an isolated passage. Yeah? And that fits very well with the idea that Sampajanya does not actually part of the Satipatthana Sutta. So what then is Sampajanya? Well, what it is, if you look at the gradual training, the gradual training has, you know, as a standard way of describing the evolution of the practice. Uh, so after the morality, you have the sense restraint formula, the uh, Indriya Sangvara Sila, and then you have the Satisam, then you have the Satisampajanya formula, yeah? And then after that, you have the abandoning of the hindrances, and then you have the attainment of the jhanas. And the abandoning of the hindrances is, uh, it is roughly equivalent to Satipatthana, because that is the purpose of Satipatthana, is to ban the hindrances. Uh, uh, it's, it's greater than that, that's a big purpose of it. Uh, and then Satipatthana happens before that, so it is part of the preliminary making the mind ready for meditation practice. Yeah, It is how we deal with the mind in daily life. When you go into the village, uh, do you... <laughs> Do you go in to, you know, to receive arms or do you go into the village, look at the pretty girls? Well, don't look at the pretty girls. Yeah, it's going to be bad for you. It's going to have bad consequences. And so we know how to use the mind in the right way. Or when we speak with each other, do we speak what is purposeful? Or do we kind of speak too much silly stuff that isn't really required? And all of these things, that is, Ajanya is knowing the purpose and suitability of the things that you are doing here. And to me, it makes very good sense that that is a preliminary practice that is part of how we live our daily life so as to enable meditation to happen, meditation being Satipatthana. This is one of the things that I thought was very interesting yeah, in, the, in, in looking at the Satipatthana Sutta. Another very interesting aspect, yeah, we're just looking at this one sutta because I'm actually, I've been teaching a course on Satipatthana here in Perth recently and I'm gonna continue with that course sooner. Uh, another very interesting uh, aspect of it is the fact that in the, the Kaya Nupasana, the first part of the Satipatthana Sutta, you find the first factors, the first four stages of Anapanasati, the you know, mindfulness of breathing. Yeah? That is found in the Kaya Nupasana. But then there is no mindfulness of breathing after that. You come to the feeling section, mindfulness of breathing is not mentioned, you come to the mind section, no mindfulness of breathing mentioned to come to the Dhamma section, no mindfulness of breathing mentioned. So what this does, it sort of gives you the feeling that mindfulness of breathing belongs to Kaya Nupasana. That's the feeling you get. And many of the traditional ways of practicing Satipatthana, if you look at the various kind of, um, uh, you know, the various kind of schools or the, or the various kind of, uh, you know, systems that have been developed, they do exactly that. They practice mindfulness of breathing first, and then they go on to other practices afterwards. But actually, that is a misunderstanding because mindfulness of breathing does not belong to Kaya Nupasana. Yeah? As I mentioned before, in Kaya Nupasana, in mindful contemplation of body, you only have the 31 parts of the body and perhaps the four elements and everything else is probably later addition. And the reason for that is because when you come to the Anapanasati Sutta, the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, actually all yeah, the four Satipatthanas are fulfilled through Mindfulness of Breathing. Yeah. It is not just, uh, not just body contemplation. So you can see how that, that whole idea that you have Mindfulness of Breathing only in the first Satipatthana, it distorts our view of the Dhamma. It gives the feeling that this is a preliminary exercise that you do not take all the way to the end of Satipatthana practice. And this is the danger of an elevating the Satipatthana Sutta saying this is the be all and end all of meditation practice. You only focus on that. You forget to look at the other suttas, which give you this broader view. That, yeah, and then you get the appropriate uh, feeling for what, uh, how to do mindfulness of breathing here. Yeah. So this is the, um, uh, the, the, the second thing that um, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I find very fascinating with that, uh, and which I think is very important to understand. Uh, then you come to things like uh, uh, the Vedana Nupasana, contemplation of feelings or sensations, uh, the second Satipatthana. 
And uh, there, the way that is explained in the Satipatthana Sutta, it is explained in a very kind of um, bare bones fashion. Yeah, it just says, well, you are aware of uh, feelings that are worldly feelings, you are aware of spiritual feelings, uh, whether they are mental or bodily, and, and these kind of things. Yeah, it is, it, but it doesn't give you the context. It doesn't say how exactly you are aware of these things. Uh, and uh, so what happens is that that kind of opens up a lot of uh, room for interpretation. Yeah, and that's why you find that they experience just the feelings in the body or whatever, or the, whatever feelings they feel at the moment. And then they take that to be Vedana Vipassana. But I think the right way of doing Vedana Vipassana is to go to the Anapanasati Sutta. Yeah, that is where it shows you how to do that in the context of meditation. You watch the breath as you watch the breath these feelings arise yeah certain feelings disappear certain feelings arise and that is how you do that uh, vedana vipassana and if you do that something very interesting comes out of that and what comes out of that is that the way this is explained in the anapanasati sutta you don't have to contemplate painful feelings yeah, yeah? In the Anapanasati Sutta, the Vedana Nupasana is only about pleasant feelings. It's about piti, it's about sukha, it's about yeah, um, uh, chitta sankara, chitta sankara, I think, yeah. and, um, and then the calming of those chitta sankaras. Yeah? So it's all about experiencing pleasant feelings. Yeah? So from that, you, you don't actually have it to sit down and kind of, you know, force yourself to watch kind of painful feelings for long periods of time. In fact, the, the right way of practicing, according to this, is just to enjoy your meditation. Yeah, go through happy feelings all the way. And then, and, and to me, that is, again, such an eye-opener because uh, so much of meditation practice done around the world, to me, errs on the side of the Atakilamatanu Yoga. Yeah, the uh, uh, tormenting the body is such a common thing. You sit down and you are told, oh, I have so much pain. Sit, watch the pain. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, this comes from me, from a overly focus on the Satipatthana Sutta at the expense of other suttas, not seeing things in combination, not understanding things, one thing in light of the other. And then you get some very astonishing results. And uh, to me, you know, reading the suit as again and again, meditation is all about happiness. It's all about joy. It's all, you know, it's supposed to be really, really enjoyable. That's what meditation is about. And I think if we are going to be able to sustain our monastics lives, especially as monastic, because there's so many things we give up as monastics, you've got to find that happiness. Yeah. If you don't find that happiness, it's going to be dry. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be boring. It's going to be, you're going to give up yeah, as soon as you kind of find the, you know, if I, as, as soon as you look at that girl in the village again, you kind of get attracted to her because you, don't have, you haven't got anything else. Yeah, you need something that that makes that this life interesting and powerful. And the same is true for lay people, but to a greater extent for monastics, because this is what we live for. Yeah? So I think these are very important insights. If you look at the way the path of meditation uh, is expressed elsewhere. Yeah? You know, one of my favorite teachings is a teaching I call dependent liberation, which is the sequence that starts off with sila, with virtue, and then it goes from virtue to uh, non-regret, and the non-regret to pamuja, which is like gladness, from gladness to piti, which is rapture, from piti to pasadi, which is calm or tranquility, from tranquility to sukha, which is happiness, and from sukha to samadhi, which is the stillness of the mind. And if you look at that sequence, it's all about happiness. And that sequence is one of the most uh, fundamental sequences uh, in the suttas because you find it in so many places. Uh, and if you compare it to the bojangas, it is virtually the same as the bojangas, but it's slightly bojangas, the factors of awakening. It is almost the same, yeah, very closely related to each other. If I use too many Pali terms, please stop me and I will, I will try to translate them because I, I kind of used to just using lots of Pali terms. And uh, so this is fundamental, yeah? And it, the way that we know that is fundamental is because it's everywhere in the suttas, yeah? It kind of permeates the suttas. Yeah? And all about happiness, all about joy, all about this positive, very, very positive explanation of the path of meditation. So that is the 
Vedana Nupassana of the Satipatthana Sutta, when you come to the Chitta Nupassana, yeah, the contemplation of mind, and again, it's a very bare bones formula. It says that you know the mind with desire, the mind without desire, the mind with ill will, the mind without ill will, the mind with delusion, the mind without delusion, the mind that is distracted, the mind that is contracted, the mind that is gone great, the mind that is liberated, and a few more, and the, the unsurpassed mind or whatever. I can't remember them all just offhand. And again, there is no nothing there about how to practice this. It doesn't actually say how you do that. Again, the Anapanasati gives you the answer. Yeah, it shows Anapanasati Sutta. You watch the breath, you experience the mind, you experience these things as you watch the breath. And again, in the Anapanasati Sutta, this builds on the previous uh, aspects of watching the breath. It goes even further. So these, again, are very profound and beautiful states of the mind, leading all the way uh, to the 12th step of Anapanasati, which is Vimochayam Chitta. Yeah, Vimochayam, that means liberating the mind, uh, the 12th step of Anapanasati Sutta. And, uh, and of course, liberating the mind in the suttas normally means attaining samadhi, attaining stillness. Uh, so it takes you all the way up to that. Anapanasati, yeah, the purpose of Satipatthana is to take you to the stillness, to sama samadhi. That's the whole point of Satipatthana practice. Uh. Mm. And then you come to the very large last part of Satipatthana Sutta, and just as you said, Venerable Nisabo, that you know this is really the two core aspects are the five hindrances and the seven factors of awakening. Uh, these two sets of dhammas are very closely related to each other in the suttas. Uh, if you go to the uh, Bodhanga Sangyuta, the uh, forty-six Sangyuta of the Sangyuta Nikaya, the collected discourse, connected discourses of the Buddha. Uh, you see in that in that collection that there's a lot of suttas where the five hindrances and the seven bodhangas, seven factors of awakening, are in found in juxtaposition to each other. And the reason for that, because as the hindrances go down, the bodhangas arise. It's like, it's like inverses, yeah? One goes down, the other one goes up. They are inverses of each other. Yeah? And uh, so uh, the last part then of the Satipatthana is then to eliminate the hindrances yeah this is why you talk about knowing the hindrance knowing how it arises not knowing how to abandon it uh, and knowing how it does not arise in the future uh, and then it has a similar expression for the bojangas yeah how they arise uh, and uh, of course the bojangas uh, they then end with samadhi yeah this is the purpose of satipatthana and so what all of this means is that when you take out you know, the four noble truths, the six sense bases, and the five aggregates from that uh, sutta, it means that you are left with a meditation practice that is geared towards samadhi. It is not really so much about insight, it's geared towards samadhi, the whole sutta. And this fits very, very well with how Satipatthana and samadhi are correlated throughout the suttas. If you look at how they're correlated, it's always Satipatthana first, then the samadhi afterwards, yeah? Noble Eightfold Path, the seventh factor is Satipatthana, the eighth factor is Sama Samadhi. Five spiritual faculties, the fourth one is Satipatthana, the fifth one is Samadhi, Samadhi Indriya, Sat Indriya. Uh, and so it is again and again, the seven factors of awakening starts off with Sati and ends with Samadhi, yeah? Again and again in the suttas, you find this particular structure. And uh, so, um, and this matters. It, this does not mean that Satipatthana has got nothing to do with Vipassana. It still has to do with Vipassana because Vipassana and Samadhi are always developed together anyway. So you start to see more clearly. But what it means is that the real insight into the Dhamma cannot happen through practicing Satipatthana in its own right. It happens by practicing Satipatthana, then going to Samadhi. And as a result of these two things coming together, that is where you have deep insight into the Dhamma. That is really what this is about. And uh, this becomes very clear, yeah, once you kind of, uh, um, again, analyze and you look at these suttas from this kind of comparative uh, perspective. And this is some of the most fascinating things that I find uh, about, uh, about these suttas. And it's very, uh, very, very interesting. Yeah. There's many more, there's, there's more things I could add, but um, maybe that's enough. Maybe we can move on a little bit. Yeah. 
Monte, that's that's really really helpful. And your the way you talked about the insights that you've had into these comparative studies, I think, is really useful. Um, something which I think could be um, problematic for some people when you talk about these early Buddhist texts and start parsing out like what might be earliest teachings and what's not. This is triggering, you know, for a lot of people who are, you know, traditional Buddhists in, in Southeast Asia, you know, um, yeah, basically who take like the whole Tipitaka as word of the Buddha. And if you highlight any one point, that's, it's triggering. I, I'm curious what you might think, you know, there's the teaching to Maha Moggallana, like I will not, for him to train, I will not speak speech, which is, which is quarrelsome. Um, or you have that definition of, um, of speaking non harsh speech, which is one abstains from harsh speech speaks speech, which is soothing to the ear affectionate that goes to the heart that's polite and appealing and pleasing to people at large. Um, there's, I recently just learned this word diplomatics, which is actually the study of texts and their historiosity, like trying to figure out the dating of texts, which is exactly what early Buddhist text research is looking into. But how do you engage in diplomatics while being diplomatic? Like, how do you speak about what's oldest while still speaking gently and not turning people <laughs> off? Um, yeah. I know I, 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 it's a very important point, and I, I think that uh, it is our job to actually present these things with gentleness and kindness, and uh, as a wish to educate people, yeah, not not to wish to. I mean, if you if you come across as aggressive or or you know as very kind of fundamentalist about these things, first of all, you should realize the limitations of your own knowledge. There's there's always uh, there's gray areas here, lots of gray areas and lots of uncertainties, but the general outline I think is very clear. And so you, uh, you know, you, I mean, someone who is aggressive usually is because of they are uncertain about their own understanding. Yeah. And I, I don't feel particularly uncertain about my understanding. So I, it's very, anyone is going to be able to convince me otherwise. So I, I don't have any problem with being gentle when I talk about these things, you know, and uh, maybe when I was a young, bit younger monk, I was a bit more <laughs> kind of edgy about, you know, these things, but, but, but over time, I kind of become more relaxed about this. So. So you just present it, yeah, because this is this is basically the truth. And you realize that people who have uh, come from a Buddhist background, from Buddhist countries, they're not used to these ideas precisely because these are ideas that have arisen quite recently, yeah? Nobody has really been privy to these uh, ideas until the last 150 years. And, 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 and you know, in a... And even the, for the first hundred years of those hundred years, it was still fairly a small circle of academics that really realized what was going on there. So we should not be surprised that people who come from a you know Asian background and who have been used to the Asian cultural context are not used to these ideas. And we should expect reactions. People are attached to their, their text. Yeah, I mean, who isn't? I'm attached to these texts to some extent. Everyone has some attachment to these things, yeah. And that's to be expected. So we should expect some pushback when we say this thing. Then that's okay. So you, you get pushback. You don't just don't take it too seriously. Yeah, I say, oh yeah, whatever. You know, it's okay. So you, you know, just look into it. You know, see what you think about it. And so you uh, you deal with them in the, in a kind way. And if you feel that you are getting agitated, well, then pull back. Don't carry on if you get agitated. Because that's when you start to say dodgy things. You know, and you kind of uh, you things start to go wrong. Yeah. But I think these are very, very important issues. And I, I think that, um, you know, especially places like Burma, where the Abhidhamma is uh, considered in such uh, very high esteem, um, it is, uh, it can be very, it can be quite detrimental. You know, you spend so much time studying the Abhidhamma and studying the Abhidhamma is almost endless. And uh, then you study the Kalapas and you, understand, you study the mind moments. And then, of course, lo and behold, you study them. And certainly you see them in your meditation as well. But actually, maybe the Buddha didn't really want us to see Kalapas and mind moments in our meditation. Yeah, this is not really what the suttas are, what the suttas really point to. Yeah. And uh, so we, um, I, I, th I think we sometimes kind of get a bit the wrong end of the stick if we focus too much on the uh, move away too far from the suttas. But be gentle, and I think over time, the I believe. I mean, sometimes we talk. You know, I was just this summer we were just mentioning QAnon, 
<laughs> during an email before and either. of course sometimes people really get the wrong end of the stick and they get it completely wrong but i think that in general the, uh, the, the if you present things in a good way and you are reasonable as a person and not too antagonistic i think the right view and the right way of thinking will eventually win out because it's just so obvious that this is the case yeah and you can't sustain that um, uh, wrong view over the long term. Sometimes you have to wait for the older generation to disappear and then the younger generation will kind of get it, you know, that's kind of sometimes what happens. So, so yeah, anyway. <laughs> and uh, I'm so appreciative of this, uh, just that exposition on the Satipatthana Sutta is really profound. That was um, meaningful, thank you. I um, would be curious to go a bit farther afield actually and you know, you spoke about um, the power of the wisdom, which has that ring of authenticity. Um, in a recent discussion we had with Ajahn Sona, he was really tracking what he saw as Buddhist influence and resonance into, say, uh, the thought of Dante in terms of the Inferno, into some of the Greek philosophers, into the early Christian mystics, just watching how these ripples of wisdom traveled much farther than we'd think. I know you've seen some interesting resonances between the Buddhist picture of the cosmos and modern understandings. I'm curious if um, you had any kind of interesting other parallels, either explicitly uh, of the Buddhist teaching influencing later cultures or just of fascinating kind of correspondences either in culture, history, or you know, modern scientific understandings, what's kind of catching your, your eye in those realms nowadays? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it is, you know, I, I am, you know, I have a lot of faith in the, um, the teachings of the Buddha. I mean, here is someone who really had a, something to give to humanity in a very powerful way. And uh, so I always take what the Buddha says very seriously. And you know, one of the interesting little suttas that he, um, that come to mind is the um, Rohitasa Sutta, yeah, where the Rohitasa, Ajahn Brahm calls him the first astronaut in the world, <laughs> and he because he travels, you know, to the tries to travel to the end of the universe. And uh, there, the Buddha says, "Well, this, you know, this the world is found in this phantom long body with this with this uh, with this consciousness," and and that's kind of astonishing when you think about that what, what does that mean the world exists in this pattern of body with this consciousness well it seems to be saying that the world actually is found in the mind rather than the mind is found in the world yeah so basically when and, and this comes back to this idea but that what we are interested in is experience an experience is internal it is something that we have we are seeing the world we are experiencing the world so we're not so concerned about what is out there. What is out there is pretty irrelevant. We're in, concerned about what is in here. And if you think about it, what we can ever really know is what is right here, what is in my experience. Everything else is really uncertain. You know, you look at the world outside, you realize that, well, what reaches your retina is kind of light waves, but light waves, they don't have any color. They don't not even have any light to them. They're just this kind of physical thing that we don't really know anything about we describe it in a certain way of it having a certain frequency and having a certain you know speed or mass or whatever but we don't really know what it actually is so experience is really the kind of the what it comes down to in buddhism and there is a trend now a very strong trend in um, uh, science and also in philosophy where by some of the kind of most uh, avant-garde scientists and philosophers they are realizing that the kind of traditional view of the world that we've had for a few centuries now the kind of materialist or 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 uh, what's it called they, they call it the um, physicalist view of the world actually is very problematic yeah it is really problematic because it leaves out the mind you have this idea of the hard problem of consciousness right this kind of thing so and uh, so there are some very interesting uh, developments in that area which tries to actually integrate the mind more into the world uh, and they're turning the whole I modern idea of the world kind of upside down there's one of them is uh, this idea is called panpsychism where consciousness is said to be uh, an as a fundamental aspect of nature another one is idealism yeah where the mind actually is everything and matter is just one aspect of mind so to speak yeah, yeah? 
And exactly where Buddhism kind of fits into this, I don't really know. I can't really say. It's, it's, it gets very complicated. But uh, what I can say is that this Buddhist idea that, you know, essentially the world exists, what is interesting about the world exists in the mind. It doesn't exist as a separate thing. It is a very, uh, fits very much with kind of the modern development of the, uh, of, of the cause of, you know, of, uh, of view of the world. There's a very interesting, uh, 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 developments in cosmology, for example. There's a famous cosmologist, he's an American cosmologist. Uh, what is his name? Now, he's the one who invented the inflation idea of cosmos that you may have heard about. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's his name again now? Anyway, he, he's a well known American cosmologist. And he is, the, he is the, he actually abandoned the idea of inflation because he felt it was, didn't really work. Yeah. And then he started with cyclical cosmology. So he's now studying cyclical cosmology, which is pretty much the same thing as we find in Buddhism. And he has a whole website on this, and he has some very nice talks there, quite technical, on uh, uh, cyclical cosmology. And it's, it's really, really fascinating that uh, that is one of the developments, which again fits really well with how we look at these things in Buddhism. So I think that, you know, over time, I think a lot of the Buddhist ideas are going to be found out to be you know, very likely to be much more, uh, much more acceptable in maybe future in the world, because we start we get more understanding of the limitations of our own uh, own current worldview. I mean, you know, you have the the famous idea of paradigms, how we are trapped in a certain paradigm, then a certain evidence builds up that go counter to that paradigm. And you have a paradigm shift. Uh, this was a, a, an American. Uh, uh, philosopher of science called Thomas Kuhn, who originally talked about this. Uh, and this, so this is happening all the time. We start to understand. We tend to be too arrogant about our own place in history. We think that we know much more than we actually do. We're not humble enough, you know, and uh, humility is a very, very good human trait. Uh, we should really have that. We should realize that just because we have iPhones doesn't mean that we are the masters of the universe. Yeah? We, there's still a lot to be learned. Uh, iPhones are, just aren't that great. <laughs> in fact, something might be downright detrimental in so many ways. And uh, so, um, you know, things like rebirth, for example, which is, has been, uh, you know, which is not, of, not accepted in the modern view. And sometimes it is not accepted by very core teachers of Buddhism. And I'm kind of shocked that they are kind of willing to sort of, you know, to sort of sideline the idea of rebirth. But once, science starts to accept the primacy of mind and mind as a core aspect of existence uh, that opens up all kinds of possibilities in the realm of rebirth in the realm of kamma and all of these kind of things uh, so i think we're gonna see quite like the mind that gets re-established within science uh, i think we're going to see some very big paradigm shifts coming in the scientific area which are going to be make it much easier to integrate uh, Buddhist teachings with the scientific outlook and the general outlook of the world. Uh, I think all of these things are probably going to come in the uh, not too distant future. And if they don't come, well, I'm still going to be <laughs> hold on to the Buddhist teachings regardless. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, those are some of the ideas that come to mind anyway. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Tanajan. Um, I, I know one of those prominent teachers that has been disavowing rebirth, uh, I've heard him referred to as the wisest fool on earth, which I think uh, was, I don't know, an interesting epithet. But uh, I'm curious, um, you spoke about the hubris of the modern, you know, understanding, um, or the modern person, and our feeling that we're, you know, at this particularly, um, this particular apex of history in terms of our knowledge. Yet, there does seem to be a place for acknowledging that we are at a somewhat pivotal moment in history. Just the iPhones are indicative of the speed at which our outside world is moving. And in the sense that our decisions now would have an outsized impact on the future, perhaps we are, you know, not masters of the universe, but certainly one could say that our moment in history has a certain valence that maybe previous moments didn't always have. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this moment in history, 
how we most skillfully interact with it with the Buddhist teachings in mind and what, yeah, how, how you would advise people who are afraid and worried and maybe some hopeful um, to move through this space. Yeah, no, I, I know what you, where you're coming from. It, it, you know, if you look at the world, it seems kind of, uh, it's easy to get worried, yeah, about where the world is heading. You look at climate change, you look at, um, well, I mean, some people are, are worried about COVID, but COVID is nothing compared to the big problems of the world. COVID is like peanuts. Yeah? The big problems are far worse than that. Uh, politics, yeah, the, the great powers of the world. Your country is one of the <laughs> great powers of the world, kind of saber, saber rat, ratting and, and kind of, you know, causing all kinds of uh, issues for everyone. The whole world is kind of getting concerned. But I think it is the wrong way of, of thinking about things. I, I think that, yes, we do our best to look after the world. Yeah, we do our best to avoid climate change, of course. And we do our best to have peace and, and all of those kind of things. But we need to remember that one of the basic Buddhist ideas is that the world is out of control. This is the idea of Anicca. Yeah, Anicca, everything is just utterly unreliable. And there is no way that we're going to be control the world. You know, the reason why people get depressed about things is because they have an idea of how the world should the world, we should be able to deal with climate change. We should be able to deal with uh, political instability. But actually, that whole should idea is completely wrong. Yeah? There's no reason why we should, uh, because it depends on forces that are far greater than us. Uh, it depends on all kinds of things. And we have built up so many causes from the past. Uh, I mean, look at the polit politics of the United States. I mean, for anyone who lives outside of the US, it looks scary what's happening in the US. <laughs> you know, we're kind of all okay. kind we're going to stay clear of the US for a while until kind of things calm down a bit over there because it looks really kind of worrying here. But uh, these forces that are happening in the US and also elsewhere, they are very, they are kind of built up over decades, yeah, with people becoming disillusioned by government and what have you. And it is not, there's no easy solution to these things. And because of that, we should not expect that the people will find a solution. And I think this is where it really, comes in this whole idea that Buddhism is really a rejection of that sensory realm because the sensory realm is inherently unreliable. There's a very beautiful perception that you find in the suttas. It's called the Sambhaloka Anabhirata Sanya, the perception of non-delight in the whole world. Yeah, And that comes from this idea that the world just is not worth delighting in because we never know where it's going to go. And what that does, if you think about it in the right way, it increases and it empowers your practice of the spiritual path because you realize i've got to find my happiness my contentment my sense of stability somewhere else where in my inner development rather than looking at the world outside it so actually if you think about it in the right way it just empowers your spiritual path and then what you start to realize then is you start to realize well actually my future and this, of course, comes back to the whole idea of karma and all these kind of things and developing your mind. My future does not rely so much on what happens in the external world. Yeah, I mean, it. of course, the external world does affect us a little bit. I mean, it has to, but that is not the most important point. My future is made by how I live in the present moment. If I live well now, I'm going to have a good future. In two ways, you're going to have a good future because you will be able to deal with whatever problems arise in a good way. Yeah, you will be able to deal with it with kindness. You will be able to support the people around you. You have more compassion for the world, and you will even if we go back to the Stone Age. Yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah, Stone Age, no worries. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's not, a, it's not such a big deal anymore because you realize whether we have iPhones or whether we have kind of flint tools, Flintstone tools. Actually, we can still be happy, yeah, if you live well. And of course, so that is the first aspect that this life becomes much better. And of course, your future in terms of rebirth also is going to be uh, looked after if you if you live well. That's a kind of more long term thing. Yeah. So I think it just uh, it just is a reminder that the future is really about how we live. It's about the quality of our heart. It's about the quality of our life. How we treat our fellow human beings. How we treat ourselves. That is really what it is about. And if we can do that well, then our future, at least our personal future, is going to be certain and it's going to be heading in the right direction. I think it's one of the most uh, 
important things that we so often forget about the spiritual practice, uh, maybe especially as monastics, that this importance of developing kindness, yeah, of really, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I have been in monasteries where fault finding is so common, yeah, where people, um, we, we take the kind of tiny minutia of the vinaya, or not even the vinaya, but kind of this traditions that we have, we take them to be so important that we create a bad atmosphere in the monastery. You find fault with each other rather than being kind with each other. If you are going to correct, it should always come from kindness. Yeah, and uh, a lot of the time it's best not to correct anyone. Just let them get on with it. And when there's something important, then you correct them. But this idea of kindness is really the whole foundation for meditation to work. Yeah? Only when you have a kind, when you feel good about yourself inside, you feel gentle, you feel kind, you have compassion for the world outside, then the meditation will come together because you are in a good space. You feel good about yourself. So this, all of these things then hopefully come together as a consequence. Ajahn, um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm curious, so for people who don't know, uh, Ajahn Bramali has translated the whole of the Vinaya Pitaka, which is the minutia, which he's just talking about of <laughs> the rules of monks and nuns disciplines, all the thousands and tens of thousands, maybe even over a hundred thousand, you know, rules that we have. And um, I'm curious, Bhante, I mean, your approach to Vinaya that you just laid out of, of not fault finding with others. I'm curious if you could speak about what insights you've had from, from translating the Vinaya and from your own kind of practice of Vinaya. <laughs> okay, so one of the, insights is that you know sometimes people talk about the at the time of the buddha people were very different from what they are now yeah, they were really enlightened they were really good people and now it's really hard to do what they did then because we don't have the same qualities that they had at that time but uh, when you read the vinaya that you get this abuse of that idea very quickly yeah? people were just exactly the way they are now they were greedy full of desires full of ill will they would do all kind of things it's exact people were exactly the same so uh, I would say that the chances of becoming enlightened now are exactly the same, the same as they were at the time of the Buddha. We just have to, one of the, one of the biggest problems is that we have to get to the right teachings. Yeah? Once we get to the right teachings, uh, then the, uh, the chances are the same. This is one of the kind of the first insights that I, uh, I think I, I got from this. So, uh, the second thing that you get is that you start to get a bit more appreciation of um, you know, the, the Buddha differentiates, for example, between what are considered um, garukapati and lahukapati, uh, light offenses and serious offenses. Uh, and it is a serious offense that we really need to be very, very careful about because that is going to block you from moving forward. Uh. Now, the light offenses, uh, uh, we should also take them seriously. But, you know, if you occasionally breach a pachitya rule, whatever, it is not going to be the end of the world. Yeah? We don't have to feel super guilty because you uh, make a mistake. Everyone makes mistakes. You forgive yourself. You move forward uh, and you try to avoid it in the future. Yeah? But then you have all the mm, tiny, mighty rules that are found in the Vinaya. And um, one of the interesting things that you find in the Sekya rules uh, is that they are only breaches if you breach them out of disrespect. Yeah? It specifically says that. Uh, so if there is a good reason for not following those rules because our society has changed, well then, to my mind, there is no problem with breaching them because you're not breaching them out of disrespect, you're breaching them because there is a good reason why they don't hold, you know, not are useful anymore. For example, let's take some very obvious examples. You're not supposed to teach to Dhamma to someone sitting down while you are standing. Yeah, this is one of the Sekya rules. Well, in the present day, very often when you give a teaching, you might be in a lecture theater. In the lecture theater, the person who speaks will stand while everyone sits. And there's nothing disrespectful about that in that situation. And so because of that, okay, fine, it is no issue. Or, you know, in the uh, in a modern world, if, uh, if someone is wearing shoes in the West, it's not really considered disrespectful to wear shoes. So, okay, you, uh, you kind of, you get food from someone wearing shoes. Okay, it's not such a big deal, yeah. So you, you don't, again, you look at these rules with reason. You ask yourself which ones are still valuable in the present day and which ones are kind of a, 
uh, you know, the uh, kind of have expired on date, so to speak, because they don't really relate to our society anymore now. And then you realize that all the other rules in the Vinaya uh, that are not part of the Patimoka, they are that kind of rules. Yeah, they are the kind of Sekya rules. They are rules that have a, uh, they're even lesser than the Sekya rules, uh, so that they could also set to be Dukatas, but to me, they are exactly the same kind of rules. So you ask yourself, are they still valid? Do they make sense? Uh, or don't they make sense in the, in the current context? You practice them uh, according to what makes sense now. And a, a, a particular segment of rule that is very interesting in this particular context are the Garudamas, yeah? And uh, just to get a bit controversial, I was, it's good to be a bit controversial. Is that okay? Kind of <laughs> so and the Garudamas are the eight, kind of important rules uh, that are supposed to be kept by bhikkhunis. Uh, and if you look at those garudamas, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, some of them are found as pachitya rules. Uh, so of course, then they are pachityas, uh, but some of them are not even pachitya rules. Uh, and because they're not pachitya rules, they are the kind of cultural rules uh, that you find in the sekyas, that you find in the uh, minor rules in the vinya. They are that kind of rule, yeah? So I would say that those Garudamas that are not found in the Pachityas. Uh, they are minor cultural rules. Uh, and you ask yourself, do they need to be followed in the modern context or don't they? Classical would be the very first one of the Garudam. I guess it's probably the only one which really um, matters here. And that is the one where the bikini has been a bikini for 100 years, had to bow down to a bhikkhu who has been a bhikkhu for one day or just ordained it. And uh, this is not a Pachitya anywhere. Because of that, I say it is a cultural rule. And I would say in the present day, it is perfectly okay not to follow that rule. Though. In fact, in our monastery here in Perth, uh, sometimes I invite some of the bhikkhunis to uh, give a talk in our monastery. I've done that in the past. Uh, and very often the junior monks in our monastery, they will bow down to that bhikkhuni here. And I say, great, why not? You know, if this is someone to be respected, someone who has good dharma teaching, why should we not bow down to that bhikkhuni here? And that creates a very nice feeling of mutual respect when we do that. Uh, and I think it is, from my mind, uh, it is perfectly within the bounds of the Vinaya, if you understand how these rules actually function in the Vinaya. So this is one, uh, another important thing that I, I learned from the Vinaya. Another in, uh, important thing that I learned in the Vinaya is the uh, uh, significance of uh, um, the Sangha Kama, yeah, how we do Sangha Kama in the monasteries, uh, how we make decisions in the monasteries, uh, and how the Vinaya is very much based on the idea of, uh, uh, first of all, of decentralization. Yeah, there's no central authority. Every monastery is independent. Everything should be decentralized. Uh, it's a very beautiful idea. It, uh, not have hierarchies, to my mind, are inherently corruptive, they corrupt society when you have hierarchy because everyone wants to climb the hierarchy, it gives you power, everyone wants power uh, because power gives you access to all kinds of things. Uh, so it is very decentralized, which reduces that search of power, uh, which ex is exactly what we should not be looking for as monks, we should be kind of, you know, just be doing what is uh, doing the monk's life. Uh, and uh, secondly, it shows you the importance of democracy, yeah? the fact that everyone has a vote, everyone has the right to stop a decision they don't like. Yeah. And this is something that we really need to reclaim in the Western world because, because of the Asian society, the Asian values, which are actually quite different from the values of the West. Yeah, you have the Confucian values that are very hierarchical very often. And because the, it, uh, the Asian values have sort of combined with the Buddhist values, uh, you have lost some of this idea of democracy and you have abbots that are all powerful and these kind of things, very common in the uh, in parts of the uh, Theravada world. And I think that uh, in the West, we should try to reclaim some of these democratic values that we find in the Vinaya. And uh, one of the nice things about living here at Bodhinyana Monastery is that Ajahn Brahm is, even though he's a very strong personality in many ways, uh, he is also very willing to listen, yeah? If someone really is against something, he will listen. And you are not afraid of saying your opinion in our monastery. In our monastery, you can say whatever you want. And Ajahn Brahm is not, you know, is, is gonna be fine with that. Uh, and I am probably one of the worst. I argue with Ajahn Brahm all the time. He's probably fed up with me because of all the arguments. But uh, anyway, <laughs> that's what happens. Uh, and that is the way it should be. We should have the scope and the ability to disagree and to look at things in different ways. Uh, 
And that is part of the whole democratic outlook uh, that you find in the early suttas. Uh, and to me, this is uh, actually one of the, I think, very far-sighted ideas of the Buddha to lay down the Sangha in this way, uh, because you're creating a structure which really can survive for the long term, but there's a minimum chance of getting corrupted uh, because of that de democracy. Those monasteries who, who live in the right way will be supported by the laity. Those monasteries who don't live in the right way, the laity will often uh, uh, you know, not support them. And so they, you will still have the survival of the good monasteries. You don't need a hierarchy to enforce this kind of survival. In fact, the hierarchy, to my mind, uh, increases the chance of corruption and the destruction of the Sangha. That's how I tend to see this. Uh, Anyway, some of some ideas there, Venable, of the, uh, yeah. No, and I, I really appreciate you moving into this realm because I, I mean, certainly it's an uh, issue extremely close to my heart um, around, you know, how to be supportive of uh, my sisters in robes as well. And um, first of all, do we have you for another five minutes or 10 minutes? You can have me until nine o'clock, then my internet cuts out. So you have to <laughs> right, great, thank so you. Another, another 15 minutes might, might work, actually. So, okay, yeah. Um, well, just, uh, yeah, if if it does cut out quickly, uh, I just want to say how, how much we've appreciated this time, but we'll do a proper um, respect paying at the end if we don't get cut off. <laughs> um, yeah. Kananjan, I'm curious if, you know, speaking on this, this point of, um, you know, you, you mentioned the Garu Dhammas and uh, the relationship between bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Um, how have you seen this play out in terms of, um, you know, how the two genders live together? Um, you know, there's some who would uh, sort of espouse more of a, a very communal living situation, others to kind of self-governing communities, but nearby. What have you seen to be the most harmonious um, or, or fruitful relationship between uh, communities of different gender. Yeah, I yeah I I think the way we have it here in Perth works very well. I, it's not the only way of doing it, but it's certainly one way, and that is we have about there's a the distance to the nuns monastery is, is over an hour over an hour away. It's about one hour twenty minutes drive between the two monasteries. Uh, and that seems to be a good distance. Sometimes we go there to give teachings for the big community. Sometimes they come here to listen to the Dhamma talks. It's just kind of within driving distance. A little bit long to drive just for a Dhamma talk, but still they, they come occasionally. And I think that's, that's good because it uh, creates, you don't get too friendly. I mean, there's always a, a danger there that if you get too friendly with women, whether they're bikinis or not, there's always a danger of, uh, you know, the, you lose your way a little bit. And uh, especially when someone is a bhikkhuni because if there are bhikkhunis they will you know lay people they come and go more but bhikkhunis they're always there and if you get friendly with them you kind of build up that uh, friendship which can lead can lead people astray so i think that the way we have it here is quite good i think you can do it in other ways i mean there is a, another monastery here in australia called newbury monastery where ajahn ram is also uh, the um, kind of spiritual director, part of the Buddhist Society of Victoria. And there they have a large property and they have the bhikkhus in one end and the bhikkhun is at the other end of the property. Yeah. And uh, maybe that will work. Yeah. I, I'm not entirely sure. We'll have to see how kind of things happen in the future, but it might also work. Yeah. But I, I think that the, the, the model we have found here in Perth actually is a, is a good one. The downside of the model we have here is that it's quite expensive yeah, because you need two different properties and you need to kind of all of that. So it needs more support in terms of, um, yeah, especially especially financial support to be able to, to, to do that. That's the kind of downside of it. Uh, um, but I do think it is useful to have some interaction. I do think it is uh, it is nice to be able to give the bhikkhunis support. Sometimes the bhikkhunis can give the monks support. They can give you some feedback. They can give you some ideas. So that mutual uh, mutual support, I think, is uh, very uh, very beneficial. So I think it is. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's something that we should be doing. So not too far apart, but I think is useful as well. Yeah. Thank you, Tana John. And if, if we can ask uh, one more, just uh, a question I'm very curious about. It's um, currently there's this, uh, you know, 
fad of psychedelic therapies. Um, and it's not just a fad, you know, there's real good research behind it now with John Hopkins and NYU, decreased fear of death, um, you know, a, a variety of benefits. How do we interact with that realm, you know, seeing as these therapies seem to be sort of problematic with the fifth precept? <laughs> you asked for controversy. Yeah. I'm giving yeah. it to you. <laughs> yeah, no, that, yeah, no, thanks. Thank, I like that. Enjoy that. I, I really like to get some questions like that. Actually, and, uh, it, it's a uh, it's a tricky one. But I, you know, it, the way you are describing it, it is used largely like a medicine uh, uh, to kind of to help you uh, med medicinally. Uh, I mean, uh, with alcohol, we shouldn't be doing it even as a medicine. But um, I guess it depends. So you really have to be careful i mean it yeah i uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard one i i mean i, I know a lot of people who started out with uh, psychedelics and became monks as a consequence of using psychedelics that's a very common experience because they had a kind of different perception of the world and got them started on this path so i i'm not the kind of person who is going to condemn these things out of hand i don't think that is the right approach either but um so I would say if you use it as a medicine and it can help you to overcome anxiety, for example, or depression and these kind of things, uh, I think used wisely, it is, uh, I, I wouldn't have any problem with it personally. Uh, but I think uh, in terms of spiritual practice, uh, I would say they have a limited, very limited um, potential. They can give you some initial kick in the right direction, but they will not be able to if, if, it's, if you're really going to have spiritual progress, it has to come from the inside. It has to come from your own drive, not from some kind of external substance. So I would not recommend it as, a, as something to be used as a, you know, as a part of the spiritual path. That is where I think it goes, maybe goes too far. Yeah. Dhanajan, um, thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak with us. I know that uh, you know, our correspondence over the past year or so has been really um, just a constant, really uh, appreciated thread. And, uh, you, you know, your sort of guidance for our project as well um, is something we'll welcome and value going forward. Is, so thank you so much. Great. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to see you See you after this time, because I, I have no idea what you look like now. I know what you look like. That's kind of help, help, helpful, you know. So how what how how is your monastery? Is it only the two of you living together, or or what is it like? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, our monastery is more of a, a monastery. Um, so it's <laughs> uh, I'm actually in a hut behind some lay supporters here in Seattle, and go for alms every morning to Pike Place in Seattle, and come back here, and we're sort of seeing what will form. Um, Ajin Kovilo, what what about you? What's your situation at the moment? I'm actually uh, in university during spring and fall parts of the year. It, uh, it's a Buddhist university near Abhayagiri Monastery called City of 10,000 Buddhas, Dharma oh, yeah. Realm Buddhist University. So I'm learning mm -hmm. Sanskrit and Indian classics, Buddhist classics, Chinese classics there. So I'm kind of going back and forth between here and up to Seattle. Um, so, but yeah, hopefully in the years to come, we'll get a piece of land and it'll start off with just myself and Tanisabo, but we're open yeah. to things growing. Great, that's marvelous. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool. So, we uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful life. I often think about the monastic life and uh, how fortunate it is to you. You know, you end up as a monk, some kind of randomly. It's very hard to really see how that how it happens. Uh, and then when you eventually get to this teaching, you start reading the word of the Buddha, you kind of think, wow, I've hit upon this treasure, you know, this kind of amazing thing. And there's nothing like it, you know, anyway, in the spiritual world. It's like, it's a really unique stuff what we have in Buddhism. Right? And uh, you feel like the luckiest person in the world to have kind of hit upon these teachings, you know. So I wish you both the very best of luck and uh, all, you know, hope your monasteries and everything goes really well then. So, <laughs> marvelous. Thank you, Tanajan. Do you have any yeah. piece of it, you know, any anything you'd uh, other piece of wisdom you'd leave with us with as kind of young young monks moving into this yeah. whole realm of, you know, <laughs> doing something on our own a bit? Yeah. Just uh, just uh, don't try to control things too much and go with the flow. If you try to control, it just gets painful and difficult. And, and uh, just uh, you know, you're already doing so many of the right things, like. Uh, Basing your practice on the suttas is exactly what I would uh, 
would recommend. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't have any teachers. You have teachers as well, but the gold standard becomes the suitors. And, and uh, for, don't never forget about the most important thing in the practice, which is the foundation of Buddhism. Go back to the basics again and again and again. I think this is where people go wrong. They forget that the basics, the kindness in daily life, how we treat each other, uh, the kind of the simple things actually is the most important part for making progress in, the, in one's practice. Uh, and uh, that is where meditation comes from. And meditation does not come from just sitting hours after half, hours after hour. It comes from the qualities of heart that you bring to the meditation practice. Uh, and then you are going to be on the right track, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Tanisha. <laughs> yeah.